Chapter 11 of Meditations of Marcus Aurelius. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer. The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius by Marcus Aurelius Antoninus. Translated by George Long. Chapter 11. These are the properties of the rational soul. It sees itself, analyzes itself, and makes itself such as it chooses. The fruit which it bears itself enjoys. For the fruit of plants and that in animals which corresponds to fruits others enjoy. It obtains its own end, wherever the limit of life may be fixed. Not as in a dance and in a play and in such like things, where the whole action is incomplete, if anything cuts it short, but in every part and wherever it may be stopped, it makes what has been set before it full and complete, so that it can say, I have what is my own. And further, it traverses the whole universe and the surrounding vacuum, and surveys its form, and it extends itself into the infinity of time, and embraces and comprehends the periodical renovation of all things and it comprehends that those who come after us will see nothing new, nor have those before us seen anything more. But in a manner he who is forty years old, if he has any understanding at all, has seen by virtue of the uniformity that prevails all things which have been, and all that will be. This too is a property of the rational soul, love of one's neighbor, and truth, and modesty and to value nothing more than itself, which is also the property of law. Thus, then, right reason differs not at all from the reason of justice. Thou wilt set little value on pleasing song and dancing in the pancratium, if thou wilt distribute the melody of the voice into its several sounds, and ask thyself as to each, if thou art mastered by this for thou wilt be prevented by shame from confessing it. And in the matter of dancing, if at each movement and attitude thou wilt do the same, and the like also in the matter of the pancratium. In all things, then, except virtue and the acts of virtue, remember to apply thyself to their several parts, and by this division to come to value them little, and apply this rule also to thy whole life. What a soul that is which is ready, if at any moment it must be separated from the body, and ready to be extinguished, or dispersed, or continue to exist. But so that this readiness comes from a man's own judgment, not from mere obstinacy, as with the Christians, but considerately, and with dignity, and in a way to persuade another, without tragic show. Have I done something for the general interest? Well, then, I have had my reward. Let this always be present to thy mind, and never stop doing such good. What is thy art? To be good. And how is this accomplished well, except by general principles, some about the nature of the universe, and others about the proper constitution of man? At first, tragedies were brought on the stage as means of reminding men of the things which happened to them, and that it is according to nature for things to happen so, and that if you are delighted with what is shown on the stage, you should not be troubled with that which takes place on the larger stage. For you see that these things must be accomplished thus, and that even they bear them who cry out, O Sathiron! and indeed some things are said well by the dramatic writers, of which kind is the following especially. Me and my children, if the gods neglect, this has its reason too. And again, we must not chafe and fret at that which happens. And life's harvest reap like the wheat's fruitful ear, and other things of the same kind. After tragedy, the old comedy was introduced, which had a magisterial freedom of speech, and by its very plainness of speaking was useful in reminding men to beware of insolence, 
and for this purpose too Diogenes used to take from these writers. But as to the middle comedy which came next, observe what it was, and again, for what object the new comedy was introduced, which gradually sunk down into a mere mimic artifice. That some good things are said even by these writers, everybody knows. But the whole plan of such poetry and dramaturgy, to what end does it look? How plain does it appear that there is not another condition of life so well suited for philosophizing as this in which thou now happenest to be? A branch cut off from the adjacent branch must of necessity be cut off from the whole tree also. So to a man, when he is separated from another man, has fallen off from the whole social community. Now as to a branch, another cuts it off, but a man by his own act separates himself from his neighbor when he hates him, and turns away from him, and he does not know that he has at the same time cut himself off from the whole social system. Yet he has this privilege certainly from Zeus who frames society, for it is in our power to grow again to that which is near to us, and again to become a part which helps us to make up the whole. However, if it often happens, this kind of separation, it makes it difficult for that which detaches itself to be brought to unity, and to be restored to its former condition. Finally, the branch, which from the first grew together with the tree, and has continued to have one life with it, is not like that which, after being cut off, is then ingrafted. For this is something like what the gardeners mean, when they say that it grows with the rest of the tree, but that it has not the same mind with it. As those who try to stand in thy way, when thou art proceeding according to right reason, will not be able to turn thee aside from thy proper action, so neither let them drive thee from thy benevolent feelings towards them. But be on thy guard equally in both matters, not only in the matter of steady judgment and action, but also in the matter of gentleness towards those who try to hinder or otherwise trouble thee. For this is also a weakness, to be vexed at them, as well as to be diverted from thy course of action, and to give way through fear. For both are equally deserters from their post, the man who does it through fear, and the man who is alienated from him who is by nature a kinsman and a friend. There is no nature which is inferior to art, for the arts imitate the natures of things. But if this is so, that nature which is the most perfect, and the most comprehensive of all natures, cannot fall short of the skill of art. Now all arts do the inferior things for the sake of the superior. Therefore the universal nature does so too. And, indeed, hence is the origin of justice and in justice the other virtues have their foundation. For justice will not be observed if we either care for middle things, things indifferent, or are easily deceived, and careless, and changeable. If the things do not come to thee, the pursuits and avoidances of which disturb thee, still, in a manner, thou goest to them. Let then thy judgment about them be at rest and they will remain quiet, and thou wilt not be seen either pursuing or avoiding. The spherical form of the soul maintains its figure, when it is neither extended toward any object, nor contracted inwards, nor dispersed, nor sinks down, but is illuminated by light, by which it sees the truth, the truth of all things, and the truth that is in itself. Suppose any man shall despise me. Let him look to that himself. But I will look to this, that I be not discovered doing or saying anything deserving of contempt. Shall any man hate me? Let him look to it. But I will be mild and benevolent towards every man, and ready to show even him his mistake, not reproachfully, nor yet as making a display of my endurance, but nobly and honestly, like the great Phocion, unless indeed he only assumed it. For the interior parts ought to be such, and a man ought to be seen by the gods neither dissatisfied with anything, nor complaining. For what evil is it to thee, if thou art now doing what is agreeable to thy own nature, 
and art satisfied with that which at this moment is suitable to the nature of the universe. Since thou art a human being placed at thy post, in order that what is for the common advantage may be done in some way. Men despise one another and flatter one another, and men wish to raise themselves above one another, and crouch before one another. How unsound and insincere is he who says, I have determined to deal with thee in a fair way. What art thou doing, man? There is no occasion to give this notice. It will soon show itself by acts. The voice ought to be plainly written on the forehead. Such as a man's character is, he immediately shows it in his eyes, just as he who is beloved forthwith reads everything in the eyes of lovers. The man who is honest and good ought to be exactly like a man who smells strong, so that the bystander, as soon as he comes near him, must smell whether he choose or not. But the affectation of simplicity is like a crooked stick. Nothing is more disgraceful than a wolfish friendship. Avoid this most of all. The good and simple and benevolent show all these things in the eyes, and there is no mistaking. As to living in the best way, this power is in the soul, if it be indifferent to things which are indifferent. And it will be indifferent, if it looks on each of these things separately and altogether, and if it remembers that not one of them produces in us an opinion about itself, nor comes to us, but these things remain immovable, and it is we ourselves who produce the judgments about them, and, as we may say, write them in ourselves, it being in our power not to write them, and it being in our power, if perchance these judgments have imperceptibly got a mission to our minds, to wipe them out. And if we remember also that such attention will only be for a short time, and then life will be at an end. Besides, what trouble is there at all in doing this? For if these things are according to nature, rejoice in them, and they will be easy to thee. But if contrary to nature, seek what is conformable to thy own nature, and strive towards this, even if it bring no reputation, for every man is allowed to seek his own good. Consider whence each thing is come, and of what it consists, and into what it changes, and what kind of a thing it will be when it is changed, and that it will sustain no harm. If any have offended against thee, consider first. What is my relation to men? and that we are made for one another, and in another respect I was made to be set over them, as a ram over the flock, or a bull over the herd. But examine the matter from first principles, from this. If all things are not mere atoms, it is nature which orders all things. If this is so, the inferior things exist for the sake of the superior, and these for the sake of one another. Second, consider what kind of men they are at table, in bed, and so forth, and particularly, under what compulsions in respect of opinions they are, and as to their acts, consider with what pride they do what they do. Third, that if men do rightly what they do, we ought not to be displeased, but if they do not right, it is plain that they do so involuntarily, and in ignorance. For as every soul is unwillingly deprived of the truth, so also it is unwillingly deprived of the power of behaving to each man according to his deserts. Accordingly, men are pained when they are called unjust, ungrateful, and greedy, and in a word wrongdoers to their neighbors. Fourth, consider that thou also doest many things wrong, and that thou art a man like others, and even if thou dost abstain from certain faults, still thou hast the disposition to commit them, though either through cowardice, or concern about reputation, or some such mean motive, thou dost abstain from such faults. Fifth, consider that thou dost not even understand whether men are doing wrong or not, for many things are done with a certain reference to circumstances. And in short, a man must learn a great deal to enable him to pass a correct judgment on another man's acts. Sixth, Consider when thou art much vexed or grieved that man's life is only a moment, and after a short time we are all laid out dead. 
Seventh, that it is not men's acts which disturb us, for those acts have their foundation in men's ruling principles, but it is our own opinions which disturb us. Take away these opinions, then, and resolve to dismiss thy judgment about an act as if it were something grievous, and thy anger is gone. How, then, shall I take away these opinions? By reflecting that no wrongful act of another brings shame on thee. For unless that which is shameful is alone bad, thou also must of necessity do many things wrong, and become a robber in everything else. Eighth, consider how much more pain is brought on us by the anger and vexation caused by such acts than by the acts themselves at which we are angry and vexed. Ninth, consider that a good disposition is invincible, if it be genuine, and not an affected smile and acting a part. For what will the most violent man do to thee, if thou continuest to be of a kind disposition towards him, and if, as opportunity offers, thou gently admonishest him, and calmly correctest his errors at the very time when he is trying to do thee harm, saying, Not so, my child. We are constituted by nature for something else. I shall certainly not be injured, but thou art injuring thyself, my child. And show him with gentle tact and by general principles that this is so, and that even bees do not do as he does, nor any animals which are formed by nature to be gregarious. And thou must not do this neither with any double meaning, nor in the way of reproach, but affectionately, and without any rancor in thy soul. And not as if thou wert lecturing him, nor yet that any bystander may admire, but either when he is alone, and if others are present. Remember these nine rules, as if thou hadst received them as a gift from the muses, and begin at last to be a man while thou livest. But thou must equally avoid flattering men and being vexed at them, for both are unsocial and lead to harm. And let this truth be present to thee in the excitement of anger, that to be moved by passion is not manly, but that mildness and gentleness, as they are more agreeable to human nature, so also are they more manly. And he who possesses these qualities possesses strength, nerves, and courage, and not the man who is subject to fits of passion and discontent. For in the same degree in which a man's mind is nearer to freedom from all passion, in the same degree also is it nearer to strength. And as the sense of pain is a characteristic of weakness, so also is anger. For he who yields to pain, and he who yields to anger, both are wounded, and both submit. But if thou wilt, receive also a tenth present from the leader of the muses, Apollo, and it is this, that to expect bad men not to do wrong is madness, for he who expects this desires an impossibility. But to allow men to behave so to others, and to expect them not to do thee any wrong, is irrational and tyrannical. There are four principal aberrations of the superior faculty, against which thou shouldst be constantly on thy guard, and when thou hast detected them, thou shouldst wipe them out, and say on each occasion thus, This thought is not necessary. This tends to destroy social union. This which thou art going to say comes not from the real thoughts. For thou shouldst consider it among the most absurd of things, for a man not to speak from his real thoughts. But the fourth is when thou shalt reproach thyself for anything. For this is an evidence of the diviner part within thee being overpowered and yielding to the less honorable and to the perishable part, the body, and to its gross pleasures. Thy aerial part and all the fiery parts which are mingled in thee, though by nature they have an upward tendency, still in obedience to the disposition of the universe they are overpowered here in the compound mass, the body and also the whole of the earthy part in thee, and the watery, though their tendency is downwards, still are raised up, and occupy a position which is not their natural one. In this manner, then, the elemental parts obey the universal, for when they have been fixed in any place, perforce they remain there, until again the universal shall sound the signal for dissolution. Is it not then strange that thy intelligent part only should be disobedient, and discontented with its own place? 
and yet no force is imposed on it, but only those things which are conformable to its nature. Still, it does not submit, but is carried in the opposite direction. For the movement toward injustice and intemperance, and to anger and grief and fear, is nothing else than the act of one who deviates from nature. And also when the ruling faculty is discontented with anything that happens, then too it deserts its post, for it is constituted for piety and reverence toward the gods, no less than for justice. For these qualities also are comprehended under the generic term of contentment with the constitution of things, and indeed they are prior to acts of justice. He who has not one and always the same object in life cannot be one and the same all through his life. But what I have said is not enough, unless this also is added, what this object ought to be. For as there is not the same opinion about all the things which in some way or other are considered by the majority to be good, but only about some certain things, that is, things which concern the common interest, so also we ought to propose to ourselves an object which shall be of a common kind, social and political. For he who directs all his own efforts to this object will make all his acts alike, and thus will always be the same. Think of the country mouse, and of the town mouse, and of the alarm and trepidation of the town mouse. Socrates used to call the opinions of the many by the name of Lamii, bugbears to frighten children. The Lacedaemonians, at their public spectacles, used to set seats in the shade for strangers, but themselves sat down anywhere. Socrates excused himself to Perdiccas for not going to him, saying, It is because I would not perish by the worst of all ends. That is, I would not receive a favor, and then be unable to return it. In the writings of the Ephesians there was this precept, constantly to think of someone of the men of former times who practiced virtue. The Pythagoreans bid us in the morning look to the heavens, that we may be reminded of those bodies which continually do the same things, and in the same manner perform their work, and also be reminded of their purity and nudity, for there is no veil over a star. Consider what a man Socrates was when he dressed himself in a skin, after Xanthippe had taken his cloak and gone out and what Socrates said to his friends who were ashamed of him, and drew back from him when they saw him dressed thus. Neither in writing nor in reading wilt thou be able to lay down rules for others, before thou shalt have learned to obey rules thyself. Much more is this so in life. A slave thou art, free speech is not for thee. And my heart laughed within, Odyssey 9, 4, 13. And virtue they will curse, speaking harsh words. Hesiod, Works and Days, 184. To look for the fig in winter is a madman's act. Such is he who looks for his child when it is no longer allowed. Epictetus 3, 24, 87. When a man kisses his child, said Epictetus, he should whisper to himself, Tomorrow, perchance, thou wilt die. But those are words of bad omen. No word is a word of bad omen, said Epictetus, which expresses any work of nature. Or, if it is so, it is also a word of bad omen to speak of the ears of corn being reaped. Epictetus 3.24.88 The unripe grape, the ripe bunch, the dried grape, all are changes, not into nothing, but into something which exists not yet. Epictetus 3.24 No man can rob us of our free will. Epictetus 3.22.105 Epictetus also said, A man must discover an art, or rules, with respect to giving his assent, and in respect to his movements, he must be careful that they be made with regard to circumstances, that they be consistent with social interests, that they have regard to the value of the object, 
and as to sensual desire, he should altogether keep away from it. And as to avoidance, he should not show it with respect to any of the things which are not in our power. The dispute, then, he said, is not about any common matter, but about being mad or not. Socrates used to say, What do you want, souls of rational men or irrational? Souls of rational men. Of what rational men, sound or unsound? Sound. Why then do you not seek for them? Because we have them. Why then do you fight and quarrel? End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Meditations of Marcus Aurelius This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leon Meyer The Meditations of Marcus Aurelius By Marcus Aurelius Antoninus Translated by George Long Chapter 12 All those things at which thou wishest to arrive by a circuitous road, thou canst have now, if thou dost not refuse them to thyself. And this means, if thou wilt, take no notice of all the past, and trust the future to providence, and direct the present only conformably to piety and justice conformably to piety, that thou mayest be content with the lot which is assigned to thee, for nature designed it for thee, and thee for it, conformably to justice, that thou mayest always speak the truth freely, and without disguise, and do the things which are agreeable to law, and according to the worth of each. And let neither another man's wickedness hinder thee, nor opinion, nor voice, nor yet the sensations of the poor flesh which has grown about thee, for the passive part will look to this. If then, whatever the time may be when thou shalt be near to thy departure, neglecting everything else, thou shalt respect only thy ruling faculty and the divinity within thee. And if thou shalt be afraid, not because thou must sometimes cease to live, but if thou shalt fear never to have begun to live according to nature, then thou wilt be a man worthy of the universe which has produced thee, and thou wilt cease to be a stranger in thy native land, and to wonder at things which happen daily as if they were something unexpected, and to be dependent on this or that. God sees the minds of all men, bared of the material vesture, and rind in impurities. For with his intellectual part alone, he touches the intelligence only which has flowed, and been derived from himself into these bodies. And if thou also usest thyself to do this, thou wilt rid thyself of thy much trouble. For he who regards not the poor flesh which envelops him, surely will not trouble himself by looking after raiment and dwelling and fame and such like externals and show. The things are three of which thou art composed, a little body, a little breath, intelligence. Of these the first two are thine, so far as it is thy duty to take care of them. But the third alone is properly thine, Therefore, if thou shalt separate from thyself, that is, from thy understanding, whatever others do or say, and whatever thou hast done or said thyself, and whatever future things trouble thee because they may happen, and whatever in the body which envelops thee, or in the breath, which is by nature associated with the body, is attached to thee independent of thy will, and whatever the external circumfluent vortex whirls round, so that the intellectual power, exempt from the things of fate, can live pure and free by itself, doing what is just, and accepting what happens, and saying the truth. If thou wilt separate, I say, from this ruling faculty the things which are attached to it, by the impressions of sense, and the things of time to come, and of time that is past, and wilt make thyself like Empedocles a sphere, all round, and in its joyous rest reposing. 
and if thou shalt strive to live only what is really thy life, that is, the present, then thou wilt be able to pass that portion of life which remains for thee up to the time of thy death, free from perturbations, nobly and obedient to the God that is within thee. I have often wondered how it is that every man loves himself more than all the rest of men, but yet sets less value on his own opinion of himself than on the opinion of others. If then a god or a wise teacher should present himself to a man, and bid him to think of nothing, and to design nothing which he would not express as soon as he conceived it, he could not endure it even for a single day. So much more respect have we to what our neighbors shall think of us, than to what we shall think of ourselves. How can it be that the gods, after having arranged all things well and benevolently for mankind, have overlooked this alone, that some men, and very good men, and men who, as we may say, have had most communion with the divinity, and through pious acts and religious observances, have been most intimate with the divinity, when they have once died, should never exist again? but should be completely extinguished. But if this is so, be assured that if it ought to have been otherwise, the gods would have done it. For if it were just, it would also be possible. And if it were according to nature, nature would have had it so. But because it is not so, if in fact it is not so, be thou convinced that it ought not to have been so. For thou seest even of thyself that in this inquiry thou art disputing with the deity, and we should not thus dispute with the gods, unless they were most excellent and most just. But if this is so, they would not have allowed anything in the ordering of the universe to be neglected unjustly and irrationally. Practice thyself even in the things which thou despairest of accomplishing. For even the left hand, which is ineffectual for all other things for want of practice, holds the bridle more vigorously than the right hand, for it has been practiced in this. Consider in what condition, both in body and soul, a man should be when he is overtaken by death. And consider the shortness of life, the boundless abyss of time, past and future, the feebleness of all matter. Contemplate the formative principles of things bare of their coverings, the purposes of actions. Consider what pain is, what pleasure is, and death and fame, who is to himself the cause of his uneasiness, how no man is hindered by another, that everything is opinion. In the application of thy principles, thou must be like the Pancratiast, not like the gladiator. For the gladiator lets fall the sword which he uses, and is killed. But the other always has his hand, and needs to do nothing else than use it. See what things are in themselves, dividing them into matter, form, and purpose. What a power man has to do, nothing except what God will approve, and to accept all that God may give him. With respect to that which happens conformably to nature, we ought to blame neither gods, for they do nothing wrong either voluntarily or involuntarily, nor men, for they do nothing wrong except involuntarily. Consequently, we should blame nobody. How ridiculous, and what a stranger he is, who is surprised at anything which happens in life. Either there is a fatal necessity and invincible order, or a kind providence, or a confusion without a purpose and without a director. If, then, there is an invincible necessity, why dost thou resist? But if there is a providence which allows itself to be propitiated, Make thyself worthy of the help of the divinity. But if there is a confusion without a governor, 
be content that in such a tempest thou hast in thyself a certain ruling intelligence. And even if the tempest carry thee away, let it carry away the poor flesh, the poor breath, everything else, for the intelligence, at least, it will not carry away. Does the light of the lamp shine without losing its splendor until it is extinguished? And shall the truth which is in thee, and justice, and temperance, be extinguished before thy death? When a man has presented the appearance of having done wrong, say, How then do I know if this is a wrongful act? And even if he has done wrong, how do I know that he has not condemned himself? And so this is like tearing his own face. Consider that he who would not have the bad man do wrong is like the man who would not have the fig tree to bear juice in the figs, and infants to cry, and the horse to neigh, and whatever else must of necessity be. For what must a man do who has such a character? If then thou art irritable, cure this man's disposition. If it is not right, do not do it. If it is not true, do not say it. In everything, always observe what the thing is which produces for thee an appearance, and resolve it by dividing it into the formal, the material, the purpose, and the time within which it must end. Perceive at last that thou hast in thee something better and more divine than the things which cause the various effects, and as it were pull thee by the strings. What is there now in my mind? Is it fear, or suspicion, or desire, or anything of the kind? First, do nothing inconsiderately, nor without a purpose. Second, make thy acts refer to nothing else than to a social end. Consider that before long thou wilt be nobody and nowhere, nor will any of the things exist which thou now seest, nor any of those who are now living. For all things are formed by nature to change and be turned and to perish in order that other things in continuous succession may exist. Consider that everything is opinion, and opinion is in thy power. Take away, then, when thou choosest, thy opinion, and, like a mariner who has doubled the promontory, thou wilt find calm, everything stable, and a waveless bay. Any one activity, wherever it may be, when it is ceased at its proper time, suffers no evil because it is ceased, nor he who has done this act does he suffer any evil for this reason that the act has ceased. In like manner, then, the whole which consists of all the acts which is our life, if it cease at its proper time, suffers no evil for this reason that it has ceased nor he who has terminated this series at the proper time has he been ill dealt with. But the proper time and the limit nature fixes, sometimes, as in old age, the peculiar nature of man, but always the universal nature, by the change of whose parts the whole universe continues ever young and perfect. And everything which is useful to the universal is always good and in season. Therefore the termination of life for every man is no evil, because neither is it shameful, since it is both independent of the will and not opposed to the general interest. But it is good, since it is seasonable and profitable to and congruent with the universal. For thus, too, he is moved by the deity, who is moved in the same manner with the deity, and moved towards the same things in his mind. These three principles thou must have in readiness. In the things which thou doest, do nothing either inconsiderately, or otherwise as justice herself would act. But with respect to what may happen to thee from without, 
consider that it happens either by chance or according to providence, and thou must neither blame chance nor accuse providence. Second, consider what every being is, from the seed to the time of its receiving a soul, and from the reception of a soul to the giving back of the same, and of what things every being is compounded, and into what things it is resolved. Third, if thou shouldest suddenly be raised up above the earth, and shouldest look down on human beings, and observe the variety of them, how great it is, and at the same time also shouldest see at a glance how great is the number of beings who dwell all around in the air and the ether, consider that as often as thou shouldest be raised up, thou wouldest see the same things, sameness of form, and shortness of duration. Are these things to be proud of? Cast away opinion, thou art saved. Who then hinders thee from casting it away? When thou art troubled about anything, thou hast forgotten this, that all things happen according to the universal nature, and forgotten this, that a man's wrongful act is nothing to thee, and further thou hast forgotten this, that everything which happens always happens so, and will happen so, and now happens so everywhere. Forgotten this, too, how close is the kinship between a man and the whole human race, for it is a community, not of a little blood or seed, but of intelligence. And thou hast forgotten this, too, that every man's intelligence is a god, and is an efflux of the deity. And forgotten this, that nothing is a man's own, but that his child and his body and his very soul came from the deity. Forgotten this, that everything is opinion. And lastly, thou hast forgotten that every man lives the present time only, and loses only this. Constantly bring to thy recollection those who have complained greatly about anything, those who have been most conspicuous by the greatest fame or misfortunes or enmities or fortunes of any kind. Then think, where are they all now? Smoke and ash and a tail, or not even a tail. And let there be present to thy mind also everything of this sort, how Fabius Catilinus lived in the country, and Lucius Lupus in his gardens, and Sturtinius at Baiae, and Tiberius at Caprii, and Rufus at Velia. And, in fine, think of the eager pursuit of anything conjoined with pride, and how worthless everything is, after which men violently strain, and how much more philosophical it is for a man in the opportunities presented to him to show himself just, temperate, obedient to the gods, and to do this with all simplicity. For the pride which is proud of its want of pride is the most intolerable of all. To those who ask, Where hast thou seen the gods, or how dost thou comprehend that they exist, and so worshipest them? I answer, in the first place, they may be seen even with the eyes. In the second place, neither have I seen even my own soul, and yet I honor it. Thus, then, with respect to the gods, from what I constantly experience of their power, from this I comprehend that they exist, and I venerate them. The safety of life is this, to examine everything all through, what it is itself, what is its material, what the formal part, with all thy soul to do justice and to say the truth. What remains except to enjoy life by joining one good thing to another, so as not to leave even the smallest intervals between? There is one light of the sun, though it is interrupted by walls, mountains, and other things infinite. There is one common substance, though it is distributed among countless bodies which have their several qualities. There is one soul, though it is distributed among infinite natures and individual circumscriptions. There is one intelligent soul, though it seems to be divided. 
Now, in the things which have been mentioned, all the other parts, such as those which are air and matter, are without sensation, and have no fellowship, and yet even these parts the intelligent principle holds together, and the gravitation towards the same. But intellect, in a peculiar manner, tends to that which is of the same kin, and combines with it, and the feeling for communion is not interrupted. What dost thou wish? To continue to exist? Well, dost thou wish to have sensation, movement, growth, and then again to cease to grow, to use thy speech, to think? What is there of all these things which seems to thee worth desiring? But if it is easy to set little value on all these things, turn to that which remains, which is to follow reason and God. But it is inconsistent with honoring reason and God to be troubled, because by death a man will be deprived of the other things. How small a part of the boundless and unfathomable time is assigned to every man, for it is very soon swallowed up in the eternal, and how small a part of the whole substance, and how small a part of the universal soul, and on what a small clod of the whole earth thou creepest. Reflecting on all this, consider nothing to be great, except to act as thy nature leads thee, and to endure that which the common nature brings. How does the ruling faculty make use of itself? For all lies in this. But everything else, whether it is in the power of thy will or not, is only lifeless ashes and smoke. This reflection is most adapted to move us to contempt of death, that even those who think pleasure to be a good, and pain an evil, still have despised it. The man to whom that only is good which comes in due season, and to whom it is the same thing whether he has done more or fewer acts conformable to right reason, and to whom it makes no difference whether he contemplates the world for a longer or a shorter time, for this man neither is death a terrible thing. Man, thou hast been a citizen in this great state, the world. What difference does it make to thee, whether for five years or three? For that which is conformable to the laws is just for all. Where is the hardship, then, if no tyrant, nor yet an unjust judge, sends thee away from the state, but nature who brought thee into it? The same as if a praetor who is employed an actor dismisses him from the stage. But I have not finished the five acts, but only three of them. Thou sayest well, but in life the three acts are the whole drama. For what shall be a complete drama is determined by him who was once the cause of its composition, and now of its dissolution. But thou art the cause of neither. Depart, then, satisfied. For he also who releases thee is satisfied. End of chapter 12